Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon, good morning, possibly good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Charlie Sharpless. I'm the Assistant Director uh, for Research at Princeton University's Anlinger Center for Energy and the Environment. Today, I'm pleased to present the second talk in our Distinguished Postdoctoral Fellows webinar series. The Distinguished Postdoctoral Fellows program at the Anlinger Center supports outstanding young researchers working to solve pressing environmental problems related to energy use. Fellows collaborate with multiple investigators at Princeton uh, <laughs> sorry, to advance the center's mission of finding practical solutions for sustainable energy and environmental protection. Consequently, their research integrates multiple disciplines from fundamental science to engineering, architecture, social sciences, public policy, and beyond. The result is a fascinating breadth of work that we are very excited to highlight with this summer webinar series. The fellows have accomplished amazing things, published regularly in high quality journals, and gone on to faculty positions at leading universities. Today, our speaker is Dr. Tapamoy Bhattacharjee. Tapa holds a BS in chemical engineering from Jadavpur University in India and a PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Florida. For the past two years, he has worked with Sujit Tata, an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. Broadly speaking, research in Sujit's lab examines chemical and physical interactions within heterogeneous porous media. Um, and how that uh, controls the dynamics of soft materials, such as fluids, polymers, biological tissues, colloids, or even bacteria, as you'll hear today. And in the realm of energy and environment, this understanding can help improve design and operation of processes as diverse as bioremediation and carbon dioxide sequestration. Unfortunately, Sajid couldn't join us today, but he's prepared a video introduction for Tapa's talk. Before playing that introduction, I'd like to note that if you have a question at any point in the talk, please type it into the Q&A box. At the end of Tapa's presentation, we'll be happy to address as many questions as we can fit into the available time. With that, here is Sajid to introduce Tapa further. Hi everyone, thank you all for being here today. My name is Sajid Dada. I'm an assistant professor of chemical and biological engineering. I'm also an associated faculty member at the Anlinger Center for Energy and the Environment. And today it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Tapamoy Patacharji, or Tapa as he's known. Tapa has been a distinguished postdoc at the Anlinger Center for the past two years, working primarily in, in my lab, but also establishing connections with many other labs on campus and at other institutions. And as Tapa will tell you about today, he's been studying how bacteria move in porous media, and he's developed a fundamental understanding of this process. And this is particularly important for many environmental applications, including bioremediation, where the hope is that we can use microbes to clean up dirty water. For example, in contaminated soils or sediments, the hope is that we can introduce microbes that sense the contaminants, swim through the pore space and reach the contaminants, and then degrade them in situ. But that requires us to be able to understand and predict and control how bacteria move through porous media. Typically, porous media are opaque, so you can't actually see through them. You can't actually watch what the microbes are doing. Tapa has figured out a way to actually spy on microbes in porous media, and that's what he'll tell you about today. And using this experimental platform, he's developed a new fundamental understanding of how bacteria move over large length and time scales, right? And using this knowledge, now we hope we can inform and develop better bioremediation strategies. Tapa has also figured out how to design his own microbial communities of any 3D structure and composition. And so now this opens up the exciting possibility of designing microbial communities that are optimized for water remediation, right? So this is fundamental work that tackles an important applied environmental problem. So we've been very lucky to have Tapa here at Princeton. I'm very proud of the work that he's done. And I'm going to stop talking and let Tapa um, tell you about all of his beautiful work. I just wanted to mention that if you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A box below. Um, there will be a Q&A session at the end. Without further ado, Tapa, take it away. Thank you, Sujit, for such a lovely intro. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. I know this is a very difficult time. Thank you for tuning in. And I'm also really grateful for the, uh, to the Anlinger Center leadership for organizing this talk at this extraordinary time. As you already know, my name is Tapa Moy. I go by Tapa. I am a postdoc here at the Anlingo Center. Uh, and today my goal is to tell you about 
bacterial motility in porous media, how we are studying them, and how our current understanding can help to uh, better the bioremediation strategies. This work has been primarily done at Professor Suji Dada's lab with Daniel and Jenna, both focusing on how to model bacterial chemotaxis in porous media, and Glenda and Aaron focusing on how differently shaped bacteria move through porous media. I had the privilege of interacting with a lot of experts in this field, both from Princeton and outside Princeton, which was made possible by this uh, generous funding through the Distinguished Postdoctoral Fellowship of the Anlinga Center. I am trained as a chemical engineer, and being a chemical engineer, I am fascinated by how nature cleans up the bad chemicals from its own house. And how, it, how does it do it? It does it with the help of bacteria. There are plenty of bacteria in nature. The fun fact is there are a zillion times more bacteria in, uh, on Earth than the total number of all plants and animals combined. And sure, sometimes bacteria do bad things to us, right? Uh, in uh, case of agricultural industry, they can infect plants and reduce growth or foul the corpse. They can also uh, foul the oil reservoir in oil industry by adding more and more sulfur to the oil, which makes oil extraction more costly and purification costly. But there are many, many beneficial consequences of bacteria. As human, we live in this planet, we produce a lot of pollutants. Someone needs to take care of those. And bacteria can actually degrade a lot of industrial pollutants that we create. They can also degrade a lot of biomass that we create. And where does this action goes on? It happens in the soil, it happens in the sediments or the clay and uh, you know, porous rock subsurface formations. So the overarching goal of my research is to engineer similar microenvironments where I can visualize bacterial motility. And I want to answer how bacteria interact with each other, how they uh, move through this pore space, how they can degrade these pollutants in such complex environment so we can imply those understanding to design better bioremediation process. And I'm also interested to expedite this bioremediation process. You know, community of bacteria can collectively perform some job by uh, this, uh, forming this collection of cells called, called biofilm. So we want to design artificial biofilms for cells to make biofilms of known compositions so we can expedite this bioremediation process. And I'm not the first person to think about this. There are, this is a really big area of research. There are many, many uh, interests in this field. There are three big questions in this area. People are excited to know how bacteria move through porous media, mainly because if you want to know how far they will move to start this bioremediation process, or if you want to move bacteria from one place to another, you need to know how they can diffusively move through the pore space. Uh, people are also excited to know how bacteria can actively seek out these pollutants. Because if you want this bacteria to go and degrade this chemical, you want this bacteria to actually seek out these chemicals. Bacteria can actually seek out these chemicals by a process called chemotaxis. So people are excited to know how bacteria can actively chemotax towards these contaminants in porous media. And finally, people want to design artificial biofilms to expedite this bioremediation process or to target different pollutants and enhance the targeted bioremediation of those pollutants. I am really fascinated by this area of research and today my goal is to tell you what progress I have made here in the Anlingo Center for past two years in these fields. So as I have told you that bacteria can seek out this contaminants in porous media and degrade that, people have actually studied that. People have studied that this process of chemotaxis not only helps bacteria to find the uh, pollutants, it also enhances the bioremediation when this contaminant is a chemoattractant. And what kind of contaminant can be degraded by this process of chemotaxis? 
there are plenty of those. Like it includes almost all possible chemicals that we produce in our industrial process and we release in the environment. It includes trichloroethylene, naphthalene, chemotaxis towards aromatic molecules, benzene, and toluene. So there are diversity of pollutants that we produce can be actually degraded by bacteria. And how do we design bacterial chemotaxis for bioremediation now? There are a bunch of equations on the slide, but it's simply a mass balance between the time-dependent bacterial concentration and the time-dependent chemical concentration that they are going to degrade. So there are two things that you need to be, uh, understand here. There are two key parameters. One is bacterial diffusivity. First thing we need to know, in absence of any chemicals, how much this bacteria will independently move inside a porous media. And then we need to know this chemotactic sensitivity coefficient, which tells you uh, when there is a chemical signal, when there is a pollutant present, how strongly this bacteria will seek this pollutant out. And currently, we use these two parameters, at ad hoc parameters, because there is not a single way to measure those in porous media. Uh, in fact, people have studied this process, and uh, the current status of this process is people use numerical approaches where they simulate bacterial chemotaxis either at a single cell level or at a population scale. So there exists a clear disconnect between the single cell motility and population chemotaxis in porous media. So with that state of the uh, uh, field, we decided to understand how bacteria move through porous media by visualizing them. And you know, I have already told you, bacteria are nothing new. We know about their existence for a long time. It actually dates back to almost 400 years ago. When Leeuwenhoek first reported, the letter, uh, uh, in his letter of protozoa, he reported the finding of bacteria. And since then, we are studying bacteria extensively. And uh, how do we do it? We mainly study bacterial motility in liquid culture and on soft agar plates. And you must have seen either of those in your high school microbiology lab. So what do we know from this, uh, this protocol? We learned a lot about bacteria, no doubt, from uh, culturing them in liquid culture or soft agar surfaces. We know that flagellated bacteria like E. coli, they move by run and tumble motion. What do I mean? These bacteria do have uh, small uh, helical strings, uh, which are flagella. Uh, they have five to eight flagellas attached to their body. These flagella can rotate either in counterclockwise direction or clockwise direction. When the flagella are rotating in the counterclockwise uh, direction, they bundle up and the cells start to move at a constant speed at a constant direction. This is called the run. These runs are punctuated by really tiny uh, duration tumbles, like short tumbles. During tumbles, bacteria start to rotate their flagella in the opposite direction, I mean the clockwise direction, and thus the flagella unbundle. And every time they tumble, they pick up a new direction and they run at that new direction. Overall, this process is diffusive and you can predict how far they will diffuse by, uh, you can predict their diffusivity actually by measuring their run speed and their run length. Now, as you already know, we have talked about this, that most of the bioremediation action happens in non-homogeneous material, heterogeneous material, right? Uh, it happens in porous rock, it happens in soils and sediments, and these are probably the most natural habitat of bacteria, not the liquid uh, test, uh, test tubes filled with liquid culture. So if we really want to understand how bacteria can move through this porous material, we need to visualize how cells move in this porous material. And uh, currently, that's the challenge because all of the porous media, it can be natural porous media like a rock or model porous media made from glass beads, are opaque. So it precludes the visualization of single cell motility in those porous media. 
But there exist some great theoretical approaches where people try to understand how bacteria will move through this porous material by simply thinking that, you know, bacteria are still doing the run and tumble motion. That's their natural way of moving. That's what they're doing. But the only difference is now, since they are constantly interacting with the obstacle, their run lengths get shortened uh, by the constant interaction. So your diffusivity should be given by the run speed and the shortened run length. But there are also reports which say is that these predictions do not always agree with the uh, experimental results. So what do we need? We need to visualize single bacteria motility in porous media, and we need a transparent porous material. So that's what we developed here at Princeton. We took some hydrogel particles. The fun fact is the same hydrogel particles are used to create your hand sanitizer. So we took the same dry hydrogel particles, we swelled them directly in liquid cell growth media, um, the bacterial culture media, and we packed them really close to each other. Even at this dense packing, there exist micron scale interhydrogel pores where bacteria can live, they can move, and uh, we can visualize their motility because the overall density of this hydrogel are very, very low. So they are uh, very transparent to optical light. And also, there exists another set of pores in this material. Individual hydrogel granules are also porous, but their porosity is order of like, um, I mean, their pore sizes are order of 100 nanometers. What that means, Bacteria sees the, uh, uh, see these hydrogels as like a continuous surface uh, where small molecules like nutrient or oxygen can diffuse freely through this material. Now, you can actually image this pore space uh, where bacteria can move by using a tracer particle that won't go inside this hydrogel particles but will remain trapped in this interhydrogel pores. And when you do, you start to see how porous this pore space is. It actually looks like a real porous media, where the red here is the pore space and the black uh, uh, regions are the hydrogel particles. You can track these individual particles, tracer particles, and measure this smallest dimension of the pore space. And when we do, we see the pore sizes are exponentially distributed much similar to any disordered porous media like soils or sedimentary rocks. And one more thing you might actually appreciate by simply changing the overall mass fraction of this hydrogel particles, we can tune the pore size very well. Now, um, since we can visualize tracer particles, we can also visualize bacteria in this porous media. And that's what we decided to do and ask ourselves how these bacteria are moving in this porous media. And when we did, we are completely surprised. We are totally blown away by these videos. And the reason is because this does not look like they're doing a run and tumble motion. You know, it goes against the current assumption of run and tumble motility in porous media. In fact, the cells get trapped into this tight pore space they constantly reorient their body. They eventually find out a directed pathway and hop to the next trap. So they're hopping between the traps. So we find a new form of motility, a completely new form of motility, which we are referring as hopping trapping motility. So why this hopping trapping motility is different from the run and tumble motion? To answer this, we have stained the flagella of this bacteria in pink. Uh, uh, and this bacterium also have their body stained with green. Now, this bacterium has its flagella bundled. In liquid culture, a cell with a bundled flagella will run, means it will move at a constant speed in constant direction. And they run, uh, and they run every two seconds. So that means their flagella will unbundle every two seconds. However, this cell starts inside a trap and is kind of confined in this trap. And watch its flagella. Its flagella remain bundled. It still tries to move, but it's stuck in the pore. It would have been running 
inside a liquid media, but instead it's trapped. And eventually, after 16 long seconds, it can unbundle its flagella, and then it can simply reorient its body to the perfectly aligned pathway and hop to the next pore. And this process continues. We have found many, many examples of this process, which leads us to believe that the confinement is actually suppressing the flagellar unbundling. And that is why this hopping trapping motility is fundamentally different from run and tumble motion. And how do we think about this hopping trapping motility? How can we separate these hops and traps and quantify this motion? We can look into their instantaneous speed trace and we can separate the traps from the hops. And in fact, when we look into their instantaneous change in orientation of motion, this angle D theta, delta theta, we see similar traces where pi radian means their motion is completely undirected and zero radian means their motion is perfectly directed. And if we generate a probability density of this uh, direction of motion for separately for hops and traps, we find that during hops, cells move almost at the same direction. And during traps or inside a trap, cells are moving at random direction. So we have a new form of motility. So our current understanding that diffusivity of bacteria in porous media is given by the run speed and the shortened run length doesn't hold anymore. Instead, what we are proposing is a new form of diffusivity where the diffusivity should be given by the hop length square over track time. Because during hop, cells move the most of the distance and inside a trap, cells spin the most of the time. Now, how do we think about this hop length? How do we, should we, uh, predict this hop length. Fortunately, uh, we had the privilege of talking to Professor Saul Torkota, who is in the chemistry uh, in, uh, department in Princeton, who is working in such, uh, such disordered porous media for like past 30 years. And one way to think about this disordered uh, porous media is by their cord length distribution. And in simple words, what that means, in a three-dimensional room, if you have a three-dimensional pore space, the cord lengths are if you go with a measuring tape and simply measure the length of straight lines that you can fit inside that pore. Our hypothesis is if you can know how many straight lines you can fit in those pores and you know their lengths, you should be able to predict the hops because hops only happen when bacteria find one of those straight lines or straight pathways. And indeed, we measure the hop length distribution uh, of uh, bacteria in four different porous media. We measured the cord length distribution of bacteria in this four different porous media, and we found that our hop length distribution matches with the cord length distribution, indicating that hops only happen when uh, bacteria find a directed pathway. It's only controlled by the pore space geometry. And one more thing I want you, want you to notice that if we plot the initial direction of the hopping, we found there is no directional bias. So hopping and trapping together can actually give you a diffusive, uh, diffusivity of bacteria in porous media. And then we also need to know how we should think about trapping. What sets trapping in porous media? We are not going to details into this model, but what we model, how we model this system is by simply taking the analogy of a thermally driven particle moving through uh, a disordered landscape. So our disordered landscape here is our disordered porous media, which is exponentially distributed, right? And, we, uh, and it is set by this competition between how cells will uh, how long cells will get trapped into the spore space is set by this competition between cellular activity and uh, the, the degree of confinement. And we found that if uh, we plot this trap time distribution from this theory, it should have a power law distribution. And when we measure the trap times, we found that our trap times in this porous media are also 
power law distributed, where this exponent is given by this uh, competition between solar activity and the four scale confinement. So in short, hops are set by pores geometry and traps are set by solar activity and pore geometry together. And finally, since we can measure the hops and traps, we decided to know whether this hopping trapping diffusivity can actually uh, measure a population scale diffusivity. Remember, there, is a, there was a disconnect between single cell diffusivity and population scale behavior. So we wanted to address this. So we wanted to measure this diffusivity and compare it to our macroscopic experimental results. Since we can inject a bolus of cell, we inject a bolus of dilute E. coli po population. We measured the diffusivity of cells in this population macroscopically, and we plot the diffusivity against our predicted diffusivity. This predicted diffusivity comes from a measured hop length and a measured trap time. So we found that our measured diffusivity agrees with the predicted diffusivity within a factor of three. Now, if you use the hopping trapping diffusivity with shortened hop length, you would have been here, which means you would have been off by a factor of 10 at least. So now what we have reported here is uh, we found a way to measure macroscopic diffusivity over large length and time scale of this E. coli cells uh, by simply looking into their individual cellular motility in porous media. And we have reported this work uh, last year in NatureCom. But our ultimate goal is to understand chemotaxis. Uh, we need to understand how population of a bacteria move through porous media, a dense population of bacteria. But how would you possibly create a dense population of bacteria inside a solid porous matrix? It is almost impossible, right? But fortunately enough for us, our porous media have some self-healing material properties. And during my PhD, I have developed this process of bioprinting where you can use this three-dimensional porous media as sacrificial support bath and you can drag a nozzle in any arbitrary shape and create communities of bacteria or any particle in three dimension. And you know, we created this Princeton shield because you know we have to print a Princeton shield. And um, different colors here represent different Z heights. So you can really precisely structure uh, um, cellular communities in three dimension. And if you zoom in here, you will see it is made from many, many bacteria that are jammed against each other. Each individual pixel here represents one single bacterium. You can create any complex shape using this method, but somewhere we need to draw a line. We need to start simple. And exactly that's what we did. We drew a line. This is a cylinder which is embedded inside a porous medium, a three-dimensional porous medium and you are looking from the top down. This cylinder is made from millions of E. coli cells that are crammed against each other. Each individual pixel here represents one single bacterium. And the overall field of view is actually thousands of cell lengths long. So if we watch this movie over time, what we were expecting that this bacteria will consume nutrients, they will move through this pore space and eventually they will uh, probably cover up this whole field of view. But instead what we found is this, they are forming these beautiful traveling waves. And let me remind you this, this is thousands of cell lengths longer. So they are collectively moving over thousands of their own length uh, over this long period of time. And since we are collecting this data on a confocal microscope, we can look this process from the side and we can confirm this is truly a one dimensional expansion where a cylinder of bacteria is expanding as a hollow shell. Now, if we, if we uh, focus here, you will see that the front speed that we measure from here 
are 600 times slower than the individual run speed of bacteria. And that might lead you to think that maybe, maybe the cells are not actually, uh, you know, moving. They are probably sitting there and making their progenies and uh, pushing their progenies in the forward direction. But if you zoom in in one of those locations, you will see that that is not true. Cells are actually moving into random directions. However, the front moves way slower compared to the individual cell motion. So the front propagation is not due to growth or division. It's purely due to motility and maybe growth along with that. There is one more point I wanna make on the slide. If you look into in this region, you will see there are some cells that get stuck into the pore space in the wake of the traveling wave. And these cells never move over this period of time. And why is so? Because they are stuck in the pore space. But that also leads us to believe that as these cells collectively move in this form of traveling waves, they are not deforming the porous material itself. So why is happening? How this is happening? So this is clearly a form of some form of chemotaxis, but how they are chemotaxing in porous media? And sure, chemotaxis is not a new thing. We haven't discovered chemotaxis. People are studying chemotaxis for years in liquid culture. In liquid culture, E. coli can chemotax towards a more nutrient-free zone by simply elongating their runs towards the more nutrient-free regions. So the question is, can they do the same thing in porous media? Can they simply elongate their hops towards the more nutrient-rich zone? Our assumption is no, because as we have seen, the hop lengths are set by the pore scale confinement or the cord lengths. So cells cannot actually hop for longer distance than what is available to them, whatever uh, space is available to them. So this process cannot happen in porous media. But you might say, Tapa, how do you know that these cells are not actually running less in the opposite direction? They can always stop themselves. That is true, they can, but we don't think that is possible in porous media. Main reason is we have seen that the confinement actually suppress the flagellar unbundling. So cells cannot truncate their hops at the mid wave. And in fact, to verify this, we have tracked individual cells to connect the single cell motility with the population scale chemotaxis. We have tracked all the cells in the leading edge of the wave. And we've measured their hop lengths. And we found that there is no directional bias in the hop lengths. And in fact, if you, uh, if you measured the average hop lengths in these four quarters of directionality, you will see that they all have the same probability distribution, which matches exactly with the cord length distribution. So this is exactly similar to what we found for uh, single cell behavior in absence of any chemical gradient, which means that cells are not chemotaxing by elongating their hops, then how do they possibly do this? Interestingly, there exists another mechanism of anisotropic uh, 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 chemotaxis where, by anisotropic reorientation. In simple words, cells can move towards the more nutrient-rich zone by running more often towards this more nutrient-rich zone. And how do they do this? E. coli cell can actually do this by biasing their reorientation amplitude. In simple words, remember, they can tumble, right, by unbundling their flagella. And when they unbundle their flagella, they move uh, or reorient more towards the nutrient reach zone. And E. coli cells can actually control this by recruiting different numbers of flagella into this unbundling process. Now, it had been a puzzle why this secondary mechanism even exists when cells can actually uh, 
uh, elongate their runs and move towards the more nutrient-rich zone. We think in porous media, since the primary mechanism of chemotaxis uh, cannot happen, this secondary mechanism is probably the primary mechanism of chemotaxis in their natural habitat, which is a porous media. And to verify this, we measure the probability of hopping, like how often cells can hop at different direction. And we found that indeed cells hop more often towards the more nutrient rich zone. And to verify the re uh, relative contribution of these two different mechanisms, we have measured the population scale, chemotactic front speed, from the individual cell statistics, individual hopping trapping statistics at the leading edge of the wave. And we find that if we replace this directionally dependent hop length by an average value, that does not change the, uh, the, uh, the chemotactic front speed. However, if you change this probability of hopping by a uniform distribution, that completely reduces the front speed by almost 80%, confirming that an isotropic reorientation is the dominant mechanism of chemotaxis. So we find that cell use a fundamentally different mechanism of chemotaxis inside porous media when they actively seek out this chemical or pollutants. Now, since we can actually reduce the pore size, we can systematically see what happens if we make the pore size even smaller. Does it relate to the pore size by any chance? And we find that truly, if we reduce the pore size, cells still do have these traveling waves, but their front speed becomes way much smaller. Their front speed is about 1400 times smaller than the average run speed of bacteria. And you can confirm that it's still a one dimensional expansion process when you look at this process from the side. And we azimuthally average this signal and we plot the front location of this wave. And we find that these traveling waves or the cells collectively move at a diffusive way and eventually uh, they start to move into a uh, a ballistic way where their speed becomes constant. So this transition from the slow motion to fast motion happens at this induction time. And if we uh, collapse all the data or normalize all the data by dividing by this induction time point, we find that there is a general trend between the cells motility, population scale cells motility in porous media. And in fact, uh, we have measured uh, this speed of bacteria and induction time in three different pore sizes to find that the induction time, which is given by the square points, decrease with increasing pore size, whereas the speed of bacteria, which is given by the triangular points, increase with increase in pore size. So what's happening here? How should we think about this? Bacteria are much like human. You know, uh, we, we colonize a space, we deplete that space out of nutrients or like resources, then we decide we should go to Mars. You know, bacteria are similar. Once I create this green line of bacteria, which is embedded inside this porous media filled with orange nutrients, they start to eat their nutrients around them. And they eventually set up a gradient of nutrients around them and actively chemotax towards this own gradient. So instead of a chemical pollutant here, they're chemotaxing towards their own nutrient gradient, which has the mostly similar mechanism. So we can model this with the similar system. Now we can change since we know from the single cell dynamics, we know that's diffusivity we can replace this diffusivity in our model by an actually measured hopping trapping diffusivity. And we can uh, try to understand how this chemotactic sensitivity parameter changes as we change the pore size. So we found that our modeling, which uh, 
clearly predicts the the wave formation and the nature of the wave uh, in, in our simulations. And it also has the right features to describe this modeling. And we also found that the cells not only form these traveling waves in our model, they also start to follow the actual nutrient gradient. And if we do this process systematically in three different pore sizes, we find that not only we predict this wave formation, we also can predict how the wave speed in our numerical model. And how we are changing the pore size by simply changing this uh, hopping trapping diffusivity that we have measured in that porous media. And we found that truly our model can predict all the features of the experimental data that clearly we see a slow initial motion which transition to a fast uh, uh, ballistic motion with, of constant uh, traveling wave speed. We also find that the induction time decreases with increase in pore size and the speed increases with uh, the increase in pore size. But the most important thing we find is this chemotactic sensitivity parameter, which were assumed to be a constant parameter throughout this um, uh, until now. And we found that chemotactic sensitivity parameter, which is given by this inverted triangles, actually decrease with decreasing pore size. They are also a pore size dependent property. So what we have found in our current work, we found that in porous media, bacteria employ completely different motility to explore the pore space. We found a new approach to uh, estimate the long time diffusivity of bacteria in porous media, which we can directly employ in bioremediation models. And we have directly demonstrated that the chemotaxis is not like only a, a, a intrinsic property of a cell. It also depends on the cell four scale confinement. So we have connected the single cell behavior to the population scale chemotaxis. So since we have a deeper understanding of diffusivity and chemotactic sensitivity in porous media, we can hope for better strategies for bioremediation. So with that, I would like to say thank you and I would love to take any questions you have.